Hello and welcome back to topic 2.5. In this topic, we talk about enzymes. So if you haven't seen the last video or 2.4, you're not really um, up to date on everything about proteins, you might want to go check that out because a lot of what we learned in the last video or the last subtopic about proteins will apply today. So basically, first, real quick, I want to show you everything that IB expects you to know about this subtopic, all the understandings, applications, guidance, everything. If you want to take a moment and pause and kind of read over what you're supposed to know, if you, or if you want to come back at the end and kind of see if you understood everything that IB expects you to know. So first things first, we talk about the model of an enzyme. So say right here, this is my enzyme. First of all, we need to kind of identify the different parts of this enzyme. Um, so basically, this right here is kind of where to, is going to be where the reactants or the substrate bonds. So this is going to be known as the active site. I'll just kind of abbreviate AS. And then the rest of this will be known as the enzyme, of course. So from here, we can kind of start talking about um, what happens when a substrate bonds. So if you notice that this active site is a specific shape, we'll talk more a little bit of that, of more about that later in depth. But basically, all you need to know for this, for this um, basically how an enzyme works is it will um, take this. The substrate will approach the enzyme. It'll match the enzyme because the shape of the enzyme and the um, substrate are similar. And then in the end, we will be left, it'll say it splits it. We'll be left with our products. So basically, that's the reaction that's going on here. And basically, what happens is, is this, um, these enzymes kind of serve as catalysts. So say um, this, say we have, um, I don't know, a molecule. And it's natural reaction in order to split them. Well, what's going to happen is, is this enzyme is going to facilitate that splitting. Which is kind of just like cool if you think about it. But at the same time, say we have this square molecule that we need to split. Well, this square is not going to fit into this kind of like circular active site. So this is not going to affect this. So in this way, enzymes are very substrate specific. They will only do a certain limited amount of functions. So now over here, I kind of um, have that representation of um, the substrate binding to the active site. Um, I don't know why I do it twice, but anyways, moving on. Um, so the, real quick, I just want to kind of cover what this graph kind of means here. So basically, this is an energy versus time, and this is the reaction. So this is our normal reaction. What's going to happen here is this is the energy it takes. This is this active en activation energy. And basically, if you don't remember too much from chemistry, what an activation energy is, the energy needed to overcome. So say we remember going back to our um, first example, we have a circular mo molecule we want to split into two. Well, in order to do that, we have to overcome some sort of energy. We have to... Um, in order to do that, we have to put energy into the system first, and that's going to be the activation energy. And that's why things aren't just a lot of things aren't just spontaneously reacting. So what that enzyme does is it takes the uh, molecule and it lowers the activation energy. It's not as hard as for in order for that chemical reaction to occur. So knowing this, kind of take a minute and see if you can answer the question. So as I pointed out, this is our regular um, graph of a, just a regular reaction, and this, well, this is going to be um, our graph with that enzyme, with that catalyst. So basically, if we kind of identify the different things here, so B is going to, actually start with C here, C is going to be the activation energy. It's going to be the energy we need to put into the system in order to get over the curve, in order to make that reaction happen. So um, um, D is just the total energy of the system. It's a to total change in energy from the activation energy. The total change in energy itself would be, um, say, right here. And then B is just the difference in between these two activation energies, which leaves us with A, which is the answer because if you'll notice, this is the activation energy of that catalyst. And if you, um, if you see this ever um, on a test, it's worth noting that that catalyst or the catalyzed reaction will always be lower than the regular one. So you kind of look for the catalyst reaction, which is this curve right here, and then look for the difference in energy to find that activation energy, a little difference between the starting and the peak. So then we start getting into the models. As I said before, it kind of, there's the active site kind of matches the substrate, but it's kind of like, um, there's two different ways to look at that. So the first way is we have the um, lock and key model. And what the lock and key model is, is um, basically, the substrate has to be a perfect fit in order to be um, catalyzed by the enzyme. 
At the same time, though, we have what is known as the induced fit model. And what the induced fit model is, is that once, say, we have this um, substrate approaching, what's going to happen is it is going to change in order to accommodate for that substrate. Now, if, say, we have um, a totally, like, random, bizarre shape, well, it's not really going to be able to um, accommodate for that, but it will accommodate for some of them. And all what basically all this does is, um, real quick, we're um, going back to this, um, review the enzymes again. Um, what we need is a perfect collision. When this comes, when we have a reaction, say we have um, these two molecules are reacting, we need to have a perfect collision in order for that to occur. Um, we need, and at the same time, we need to have the energy of collision, as I stated before, be enough to overcome the activation energy. So, what um, another example besides decomposition, which I kind of mentioned before, is um, which is an anabolic reaction where we're creating. So, say maybe it has two active sites, and basically it'll collect those substrates and it'll put them together as the final product of that um, final product that we need, instead of having to just randomly by chance. Um, collide at the right orientation at the right speed. So here's a question that you might get about enzymes. I want to pause and maybe answer it. Okay, so which of the following statement is true about enzymes? Well, um, they are used to catal uh, they are used up in the reactions they catalyze. Well, that's not um, true. Enzymes are not like pro are not like the reactants. They will always be there. So this is um, not true. Aloster allosteric inhibitors bind to the active site. Well, you might not know what allosteric means at this point, so we're just going to put a question mark. They lower the activation energy. Well, that kind of makes sense. We talked about how it um, they kind of align them already, so they don't need to go at that high speed as as high of a speed. So they can kind of um, go at a lower speed, at lower energy. So that's maybe as well. Or that's the more one that we're kind of leading towards. Um, and then they supply the energy at the activation for the reaction. They don't supply, you have to kind of know here, they don't supply the energy, they lower the activation energy. So our answer is going to be um, C. Allosteric inhibition, um, if you're taking SL course, you won't really need to know about this, but basically inhibitors will um, say we have, um, kind of, kind of, they'll, they can either bind to the active site and what they'll do is they'll take up room for the actual substrate or they will bind to um, another part of the enzyme. It'll totally change the shape. Now, this can't bind there. Um, allosteric is more of an HL topic, which will be covered later. But basically, you just have to know that um, allosteric inhibitors do not bind to the active site. So then we start getting into more the function of enzymes. So there are three main factors that um, that will change how how well an enzyme is working. So if you remember back from um, back from the previous about proteins, pH and temperature are very, greatly dip, um, greatly affect how a protein um, functions. If we get too high of a temperature, it'll start to denature. If that pH varies, um, it'll start to denature. Of course, as we said with proteins, um, it'll change like the um, charge of the molecules. It'll change that. Um, it'll just kind of, it'll start making the molecule want to unravel as it changes the chemical properties. So as you'll notice for protein, we have that optimal, that optimal pH. As you go down both sides, they kind of decrease symmetrically. And um, so this is the, that, pro, that pro, uh, pH um, rate of reaction graph. If you notice, well, temperature um, is kind of a little different graph because as we increase temperature, we're actually going to increase the rate of reaction. However, once we get past this certain point, it's going to start breaking down the bonds, the intermolecular forces, and it's going to start making um, protein. It's going to break the bonds in between proteins, and it's going to start denaturing that protein and kind of depleting or ruining the enzyme. And then finally, we have the substrate concentration. What we can do is if we want the rate of reaction to increase, we can start increasing the concentration. However, you only have so many enzymes. And once they're taken up, they're gone. There's no more. So it kind of levels off. And that's kind of where we get, um, it kind of stops increasing. So these are the three main graphs that IB actually expects you to know how to draw and kind of interpret. So exactly my point, which graph shows the effect of increasing substrate concentration? Give you a second. So first of all, we have, um, look at our graph. So um, we already know that substrate, substrate concentration, as we increase it, we're going to increase the rate of the reaction. So this is decreasing. No. Um, this is kind of looking like what we think it is. It increases, it levels off. That's kind of what we're getting at here. So maybe. Um, enzyme activity, substrate concentration, as we increase, it's increasing, but then substrate concentration doesn't decrease. 
it's not going to decrease unless the substrate actually decreases. So that's not going to be C. This is more of maybe a pH graph. And then here we have it's we have the leveling off. We have the increasing. But what's happened here is you'll notice the two different curves. This is more of an outward curve. This is more of an inward curve. And basically this means that the rate of reaction, um, the rate of the increase is increasing. So as we add more substrate, it's increasing. It's, um, the, the amount that the, the rate of the reaction is increasing like kind of exponentially almost. When here it's worth, when, as you have the, as you add more substrate, you have the um, diminishing returns. You're not going to get as much, um, you're not going to get as much, a big of an increase the more you add. So this is going to be B. And you might not need, really need to know um, kind of like the explanation between them when you kind of come to like the test. You might not need to go through each answer choice, but if you're able to identify that, you'll be able to get the answer B. So here's another example of a question. What does exposure to high temperatures cause an enzyme to lose its biological properties? So if we draw the graph, we know that it's going to increase and it's going to reach its peak and it's going to decrease. So why is this decrease? Well, because as we said before, it's going to increase the temperature. It's going to break those bonds between the molecules and it's going to cause the protein to unravel. So the substrate blocks the active state at high temperatures. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would it, the substrate um, block at high temperatures? There's no correlation between those two. The three-dimensional structure of the enzyme is changed. Well, that's maybe we're talking about that, how those bonds break. And instead of we having a protein, we have starting to unravel. Chemical reactions cannot take place at high temperatures, actually quite the opposite. The higher the temperature, the faster they take place. The high temperatures increase the activation energy of reactions. Um, that's not true. Activation, in, um, if anything, it'll help the reaction take place. It's not in temperature. Lowering or raising temperature won't increase the activation energy, and that'll leave us with B. So um, at the same time, IP expects you to know how to draw experiments out of this. You won't specifically be tested on this in any way, but it's just like more of an application skill that you'll be you'll need to be able to know. So basically, for any experimentation, we're going to have to select an independent variable. So we can talk about the three factors, I guess not above, but on these past few slides, um, pH, temperature, and substrate concentration. Those you can measure either those three factors or um, later HL topics, we can start talking about inhibitors. Um, and then once you do that, you're going to select an enzyme in the substrate. Now these have to be known. So say you take lactase and you know that lactase will take lactose and break it down into um, glucose and galactose. So you know that our enzyme is lactose, uh, our lactase, you know that our substrate is lactose and you know our products are lac um, glucose and galactase, um, galactose. So from here, we have to measure the rate and the amount of decomposition. So I just kind of listed a table here of different things that you kind of want to look um, out here, out for when you um, are making a um, making our experimentation an experiment. So basically, what products are we having? What are we doing? So for this the example I gave, we have the digestion of a solid. So we can look for change in weight, change in diameter. Say we took a lactose cube and we put it inside of a um, uh, inside of this enzyme. We also have um, volume of liquid produced. All of these are different ways in which we can met, um, collect data. And again, you won't need to know any of this. This is just kind of started getting you into the process of thinking um, experimentally. So, and then at the same time, we have real world application. Now this, you will be tested on more than that experimentation. So um, basically one real world example that IB loves to push is um, the use of enzymes in order to make lactose um, free milk. So if you don't know, lactose is the sugar in milk, um, and it's many people are actually allergic, or not allergic, but they don't have the enzyme in order to digest this. So this kind of causes um, an irritable bowel and much discomfort. So basically, in order to sell milk, or in order to get people who are lactose intolerant to drink milk, they have to use, um, they have to remove the lactose. So one way to do that is um, to infuse, basically, um, use the, en the enzyme lactase and remove the milk and remove the lactose from milk since um, a lot of people don't actually have the enzyme for lactase. So you say you have a bacteria and then you um, go through the process. process. Um, in topic one, you can kind of look back at where we take the genes out of there and we insert our own 
um, lactose producing lactase producing gene, um, gene, and then we start producing producing lactase. So once we have that lactase, we can do um, something, and we can put them in something called immobilized enzymes. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take that lacto lactase and put it in um, alginate beads. So once it's in these beads, we can basically put these in like maybe like a sack. We have all the beads here and run the milk through. And what happens is is as it runs through the lat um, these enzymes, this lactase, which is trapped in these beads, will start breaking down the lactose in milk. And what we're left with is lactose-free milk, <laughs> um, LFM, I guess. Um, and basically, we can do this multiple times, and since these enzymes are not used up, we can just do that multiple times and get that lactose-free milk. Here are some other examples. Um, you won't need to know these specific names, just some, some examples, but you will need to know um, what generally they're used for. So they're used to make fuels, um, they're used, they're used in medicine, they're used in biotechnology, gene splicing, they're used in food production, dairy, um, they're used in textiles, basically processing of fibers, they're used in paper, um, pulping of woods, and you won't need to know super detailed, but you will need to know generally real-world application of enzymes. So here's an example of a question you might find on the test. For what purpose is the enzyme lactase useful? We already know, immediately as you see lactase, you're going to think, Lactose. Lactase will break that lactose into glucose and galactose. So basically, we can start looking. Production of lactose free milk. Well, now maybe that's the question because it's going to break it down if people can actually break it down. A dietary supplement um, in the, um, to aid the protein digestion of milk. Well, while it is true um, that you can kind of, um, you can, you can you can make it to where um, people can actually digest milk by um, altering the environment in their stomachs. That's not what we're looking for here. Um, for the use of coagulating milk and protein cheese, no, that's um, a different industry altogether. Improving protein consumption by developing countries that lack milk. Um, no, we're, we are, this is um, talking about if we already have milk, what are we going to do? And it's going to be that production of lactose-free milk so that people, more people can consume dairy products. So here's an example of a um, here's an example of a free response question. We're kind of running short on time here, so I'm just going to kind of give you the answers, and you can try them on your own. So define an active site, explain how the active site promotes enzyme substrate specificity, and outline the possible effects of acids. Um, so basically, um, real quick, active signs are a region where the substrate binds. Um, and when we talk about enzyme substrate specificity, we have the, we can talk about the shape. Um, we can talk about the charges. If we have a positively charged um, enzyme and a positively charged substrate, those are going to repel, right? So we're going to want specific um, we're going to want specific characteristics that kind of make them more compatible. And then we have that induced fit model as well. And then um, for the effects of acids, as we talked before, if we introduce uh, pH out of the range, it's going to affect the chemical compositions of those um, amino acids in those R groups. It's going to start changing the shape, so it's going to change that 3D structure, it's going to prevent the substrate from binding, and it's going to um, decrease that activity. However, you have to look at the other side, this IB always wants you to look at the multiple sides. Um, it can increase the activity if we're below that, or if we're above the optimal pH, and we start lowering it um, to make it more acidic, and we kind of reach that lower optimal pH. Here's another question. Um, pause and let you answer. Give the answers real quick. Outline how enzymes catalyze reactions. They increase the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy, not changing it, um, which is basically that energy barrier that prevents the reaction. Um, it remains unused and unchanged. And um, we also have the substrate joins with the enzyme at the active site to form that enzyme substrate enzyme complex. The active site usually matches with that substrate. Um, the enzyme brings the reactants, it can bring reactants together, and it basically can also make the substrate more reactive. Um, thank you.